Welcome in everybody to Bears All Access. It's brought to you by IGS Energy with Tom Thayer. I'm Jeff Joniak. We'll have the game. Bears Packers Sunday on WBBM starting at 9 a.m. Our pregame kickoff at noon. Thanks to our producers, Dan Borelli, Jordan Trudup, and the folks here at The Score. Uh, coming up, we'll be joined by DeAndre Houston Carson, the veteran safety and writer Ty Dunn, who's authored a book. Uh, it's called The Blood and Guts, How Tight Ends Save Football. Substantial time with Mike Ditka. We'll get into that. First 18 pages of the book about coach and how tight end position kind of revolved around him uh, in the 60s and beyond and we'll get into that but right now big time we're talking Bears Packers uh, meeting 206 and it looks like Justin Fields and Aaron Rodgers will share the field on Sunday well definitely trending that way and I think the crowd is excited both on a national scope of the NFL and whomever's going to be at Soldier Field on Sunday and I'm excited for it myself I want to see Justin get back on the field and I want to see him go out there and play a high-profile opponent like the Green Bay Packers in the division and Aaron Rodgers. And I hope this is super motivating to the defense to make sure that they have to be on their best and, and, and take care of business according to what Aaron Rodgers offers them. But I think it complicates the situation for the defensive coordinator of the Green Bay Packers because – you have a formula of how you want to play against Aaron Rodgers. There's ne not necessarily a formula how you play against Justin Fields, and they just played against Jalen Hurts, who put up a big rushing number against them. Uh, Joe Barry's under attack up there for sure. The 363 is, is a crazy number. Um, it, it has happened before, but uh, it just seems weird to keep hearing that number, that, that 360. But when you watched the tape of how the Packers played it, there were a lot of runs that Jalen Hurts made that we've seen from Justin Fields. There's creases that open up, there's green grass, and he's going to take it. You can't stop him from taking it. If he sees it, the invitation's too great. Just get out of bounds, try to avoid the hit. That's one way. But second, what did you think of the tackling of the Packers? Because I thought that defense heading into this year was going to be really good. Obviously, Rashawn Gary out with an ACL takes away the pass pressure. But are you a little surprised at what they've given up? You know, so, Jeff, I heard earlier on a broadcast you talked about the importance and the role of David Montgomery and the running backs according to the running game, which I still believe that is a super point of emphasis. But, you know, Jeff, when you look at how do you tackle Jalen Hurts, how do you tackle Justin Fields, there is no formula because these guys can have a two-and-a-half to four-yard separation, and you're not going to hit them. So to say, okay, you know, they used to have this – term for playing Barry Sanders back in the day and they said oh man you got to fire you got to fire when you go to tackle Barry Sanders there you can't because <laughs> he's going to make you miss in space the great Gale Sayers if you try to fire on him you're going to miss in space it's the same thing with Justin you better be able to have a condensed area and multiple bodies around him to slow him down or escort him out of bounds and that's still not a guarantee because Justin is so fluid on his feet that if there is that, I talked about that separation of distance between he and the nearest defender, he can turn a four-yard separation into a 40-yard run. So it's the hesitation that kicks in then. And now it's a little bit, though, isn't it, the, if you're thinking you're beat? Because if you're thinking about how to approach him instead of firing your cannon, so to speak, as you say, uh, that puts you in major conflict. Is that what you're suggesting here? It slows down a defense because they got to think it, about how they're going to attack him? Right. It's probably more if you slow your reaction, you're guaranteed you're going to get beat. Hmm. And that's the thing about just firing and trying to make a tackle is that you got to commit to it. And then you hope that if you commit to him and then you slow him down or you make him take an alternate direction, that there's teammates near you that can help you limit the success of the run. But, you know, if again, and I and I'm glad you brought that up. If you think you're beat, because if you slow your reaction, you're guaranteed you're going to get beat. All right, where are you in the risk reward category with this, if at all? Because there's a, a camp out there that says, hey, you know, why rush him back? Why do this? Let him get some rest, get the bye week, come back, finish the final four. Uh, what's your take on all of that? Uh, football's a risk always, whether you're healthy or you have some type of. Uh, in uh, some type of setback issue that he had when he didn't play against the Jets last week. But to me, it's you give him a week to get his legs back to the freshness that it was when this whole journey started. 
That would scare me as much as anything. And I know it's his left shoulder, and I would be cognizant of that. I would try to put him in a play-calling position that he's not exposed to getting pounded to his left side. And you can't guarantee that because it's a reactionary sport. But I'm not going to sit there and dwell on why he missed the game last week as opposed to why he's playing this week. And even from a personal standpoint, he's a 23-year-old kid who is the future of the Bears, it appears, as that's the case. And he wants to face some of the greats of the game. Those days are are dwindling with Aaron Rodgers. So if you're going to have another crack at Aaron Rodgers, I, I say go take it, right, as, as, as he is. You know, at home, uh, you're in control of the volume of the snap count. You can have a variety of formations now that Chase Claypool has been more involved in the mix, and they got some speed back with Pringle. And then you think where Cole Komet is at from the first time they played Green Bay into where he's at right now. There's a lot of different weaponry that you can use this uh, go-around against the Green Bay Packers that you are still trying to figure out your formula the last time they played them. Still a significant number of injuries, obviously, on this football team and in the secondary. As of this uh, show, we're not sure what the situation is in that regard, but it's a young secondary right now. A couple of three-year veterans, uh, and you got DeAndre Houston Carson back there, but these are guys that no, no question Aaron Rodgers will be zeroing in on. Yeah, you know, I don't look for mental mistakes out of the defensive backfield because I think guys like Jalen Johnson and DHC, DeAndre Houston Carson, will get everybody in the right place. And if someone, if there is a mistake that's being present, sometimes they can make up for that. All right, we're going to step away our first segment in the books as we get ready to meet DeAndre Houston Carson here on Bears All Access. We're brought to you by IGS Energy, and this is Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Back to Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Choose clean energy for your home at IGS.com because every good choice adds up to a better world. Jeff Joniak here with DeAndre Houston Carson, our guest. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for having me. I know it's valuable time. You know, you, as a, you're a pro, man. You're a pro through and through, and so your work day continues all the way to who knows when. And it's not just about the, the, the meetings and the practice. It's getting your body right and everything. What is your typical week like in terms of post-practice preparation for Sunday? Yeah, so post-practice, obviously, I try to do some stuff to recover, get in the training room and do some massage or whatnot. But I typically try to do all my film study when I'm, when I'm in the building. That way, when I go home, I got two kids. My daughter, she's almost three. My son's eight months. So there's not too much time to be watching too much film when I get home. So I try to do my work when I'm at work, and that way when I go home I could just be a dad. I always joke with the, with the guys. They, say me, they see me leaving at 5 o'clock with a coffee, and they're like, you drinking coffee? I'm like, I'm going to my real job. You know, my yeah, kid, yeah. kids don't care what I did today. So uh, that's typical. And then once they go to sleep, I might watch a little extra film, spend some time with my wife. And it, you know, I watch a lot of tape too, certainly not as much as a player, but that, that pad is always there calling your name, right? Really you know, and it, do you think, you know, God, maybe I should watch a little more. And is that happen a lot? It's like a magnet, and it, does it change over the course of your career? Kids aside, I mean, as a pro, how much tape are you actually diving into? Erlacher, you always used to tell me, you know, I, I can't watch too much, then I start overthinking. That that was his way. But what's your way? Um, that that is a, a reality. You can watch too. You can watch too much, or get to uh, start thinking too much about it. I would say, you know, I, I try to watch a lot of film. In the morning times, so maybe an hour or so in the morning. Um, then obviously whatever we're watching during the day. And then post-practice, all in all, maybe another maybe another hour and a half. So probably a day, you know, by myself, close, you know, two to probably two to three hours. Has it ever burned you when you have looked into it too much? Yes, yes, because yeah. sometimes you can get to guessing, you know, you think you know what they're going to run based on their formations. Um, it can help you make a lot of plays, but it can burn you, you know, if you think they're going to run a slant and the next thing they run a slant and go or something like that. Do you like have that. a memory in your career, even college, mm -hmm. where, you know, you're so glad you did it because, you know, you saw it, it just came to life, and you made a big play? Yeah, so uh, we were playing uh, James Madison University, actually. Um, my senior year was a big game, Halloween. I think we won like 44 to 41, so we weren't stopping mm -hmm. it too much. <laughs> but there was one I knew, I just knew he was going to run a slant, and uh, I was in the post. 
And uh, I, mean, I just jumped the slant, and they ran a go ball um, and just completely left my corner out to dry. He dropped the touchdown. <laughs> he dropped it. So then the very next play, they come back, and um, they run the slant, and I, picked, I ended up picking it off. Um, so I was happy, you know. That's, that's what I was saying. There's, yeah. some ris- there's some risk and some reward, but um, – Yes, I was I was happy on that one. DeAndre Houston Carson, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio six seventy the score. I love how you laid out the, the day and then you're going home to your your family because I am certain a lot of folks don't think of it in terms that way. And now you got a young team. A lot of those guys are not married. They don't have kids. They're rookies, they're young guys in the locker room. They see you basically you're briefcasing it <laughs> home to work after a, right. a day at the office, right? Mm-hmm. It, you don't visualize that as a football fan. You know, no. I, I don't think so. I yeah. think I think it's just something different. I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I kind of like it because you, you are one of the senior members of this football team, as young as it is. I, I don't think you've played on a younger team, right, no. in your seven years. No. Yeah. I don't know if anyone has played on a younger team. Right? Really- right now in the second tier, I just counted up. I think it's six rookies. Mm-hmm. Knock on wood, some guys are going to come back. Who knows? But injured or otherwise, there's six rookies. Two new guys just picked up a month ago. Two three-year vets in Vildor, who's limited uh, as of this taping this week for practice, Jalen and yourself. Right, yeah, no, it'll be an exciting opportunity for a lot of guys, but I had that experience one time. I can't remember who we were playing, but we are in the kickoff huddle before the kickoff, and I'm looking around. It's like <laughs> there's literally seven rookies out here in the kicker, so it's just me and, you know, two other guys who are yeah have any, you know. Well, that's rookies, been happening so all season on special teams. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you – do you derive some energy from these guys? Because they're wide-eyed, they're excited, this is their big chance. You know, I'm sure some of them don't feel like rookies anymore this deep in the season, but how about that? Do you do you derive some juice from that? Oh, yeah, for sure. A lot of guys bring a lot of energy. and um, It's always fun being around the rookies. They, you know. <laughs> they keep you young. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny saying that. Right, right, because you're still a young guy. Exactly, you're a young guy in the in the bigger picture for sure. DeAndre Houston Carson, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score brought to you by IGS Energy. Uh, so I, I said this on the TV show that we had on Sunday night, recapping your nine tackles. Um, I know you're a team first guy, but we have to individually, you know, go through you know highlights of the game and whatnot. And I said, this is a guy, and I, I said this at the outset here. You're a professional. You you just I, there's so much trust and belief when you're on the field, no matter what you're asked to do, how infrequent or frequent we, you're asked to do it. I think that could possibly be some of the most complimentary thing you can hear as a player. Is it not even from your coaches they speak the same way about you? Yeah, no, I'd say so. Um, obviously, you want to be someone who's trustworthy in life in general. Um, that's the way I look at it. And then football is just an extension of, you know, just another aspect of, of life that I want to be trustworthy in. Um, and to be and to be completely frank, there's there's times where you know I make mistakes out there, and it, it, I think it hurts me. Um, might hurt me a little bit more because I I do pride myself a lot in that, and I have a reputation, you know. So then when I when I do make a mistake, it's like I was the, you know I was just gotta make a mistake. So I had a few in the game, uh, to be honest, that that I wasn't proud of, but I guess that's just part of it, you know. Learning from learning from those as well, and well, trying I mean, to bounce back. Frank, <clears throat> frankly, you haven't had a ton of defensive snaps this year. Is it? Is it take some time to get comfortable out there? Uh, no, I want to say no? so. I okay. mean, that is something that a couple of people have asked me. You know, like I've, I've played a lot of football, but I haven't started or played, you know, a whole bunch on defense. But I don't think you can really account for all the accumulated reps over time, practice, you know, preseason, all those reps of playing football, uh, watching a lot of tape, seven years worth of tape. Um, so although you know having started a whole bunch, it doesn't feel like you know, I have yeah. to go in and get a groove or anything. Well, I know this. You're one of the one of, if not the first guy on the field every day. Oh yeah. Why is this? Um. So really, everyone likes doing extra work. Um, and I know I know myself. I'm I'm more likely to be inconsistent if I if I do it after after practice every day. I might have a hard practice and I'm tired. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna skip. I'm going to skip the jugs today. So I just decided – I started doing it probably two years ago. I decided to start doing all my extra work before practice. That way I knew um, two things. I knew I was going to get that extra work, and then I could I can direct how I wanted my practice to go. You know, say you're wearing pads. You might go a whole day, you're wearing pads, but you haven't. You still don't hit just because, you know, the right. play didn't come. So then I go out and do my tackles before. That way I know that I'm, you know, I'm hitting. Um, so that, that's really the only reason. Um, that's not really the only reason. Have others followed you? Have others asked about it, especially these young guys? Mm-hmm. And, and they say, hey, can we work with you? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, before it was me and uh, my boy Dion Bush. Uh, yeah. We'd be out there. We'd be out there early. Um, a lot of a lot of rookies asked me about it. Just well, not just rookies, but guys in yeah. general. And I just explained that to them. And you know, some guys try to come out early and stuff. I've actually adjusted a little bit this year. Um, adjusted a little bit. I still try to get out early, but. Um, I'm not a slave to it. I used to kind of be a slave to it where if mm-hmm. I if I wasn't able to do it, then I would just feel like completely unprepared. Ooh. Um, but now I you know, I'm not, it's it's really nice actually. I'm not a slave to that to that ritual anymore. Yeah. Um I still get out there early as much as I can, but um I've definitely adjusted as as the years have gone by. Yeah, does it uh, also <laughs> signal to these younger guys? And again, coach keeps talking about building a foundation. And he made a point of the coaches show Monday night. This is not a rebuild. This is a building, building. So building something fresh from the foundation that, that guys get into a routine that they feel works for them. It doesn't have to be replicated. I mean, it could be the same thing on, on Sundays, you know. Adewale Agunle used to come in, uh, the veteran defensive end, uh, and he'd take three showers before kickoff. I mean, that that was his routine. He had to. He'd go out there, get in the shower. Take, you know, I, I mean, why? I have no idea. But it worked for him. <laughs> right. Do, do you? Kind of counsel guys, hey, do what works for you. Um, I have, I have. Um, like if they do ask me about my routine specifically, it's like you don't have to, you don't have to do this. Yeah, you know. But it is very important, I think, to to have a consistent schedule. Um, so something that was told to me, um, you know, kind of the pre-draft process is, you know, you want to kind of do the same thing every day of the week. So like on Monday, I do the same thing every Monday. I know I do the same things every Tuesday, Wednesdays. It's just those routine as far as your recovery, your body, also watching film. That way you have less things to think about. Yeah. It's just taking some of that mental energy away. You know, some Checking guys. Boxes. Exactly. I eat the same breakfast every morning. That way I don't have to think about, okay, what do I want to eat for breakfast? You know? You're not eating the same, are you? Are you? I eat the same breakfast. What do you eat? Yeah. So typically I do uh, two pancakes, a couple pieces of bacon, three or four pieces of bacon, and just some eggs, put some hot sauce on it, some syrup. Doesn't get boring? No, I mean, sometimes it does, you know, obviously. But. I like it. You are a man of routine. So I'm messing up your vibe right now because you, oh, you're ready to get, get home, be with the kids and, and mama. you got to adapt as well. Yes. DeAndre Houston Carson, our guest. Another segment to go here with the veteran safety and special team star. Back with you after this break on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an appointment in clinic or virtually and start feeling better tomorrow with Bears Safety. DeAndre Houston Carson uh, just talking about life and football, you know. It's funny, I, some of these interviews you have a couple questions or ideas and then you just start a conversation you never get to the questions. Those are the best ones. <laughs> I had one recently with Cole Komet a couple weeks ago on television. And, you know, I think players get a kick out of that too. You know, we're just talking. We're just talking about things that relate to the game, and uh, those are always, to me, the best interviews. So I appreciate you being open and, and talking about, you know, just stuff. Yeah, of Stuff course. right I here. I don't like using the uh, the interview voice that, you know. <laughs> what is the interview voice? The interview voice is when someone asks you a question and you just have to turn on that, you know, <laughs> just that voice. Oh, I got to go watch a tape. Or, yeah, yeah, right. You know, just certain things. <laughs> yeah, you can't give them all the, all the info right, right yet. Um, this is not an easy year, Uh but it's weird. I had a conversation with uh, uh, Mike Pinnell in the locker room, a veteran who's been on many, many teams, some very successful teams, Packers, Kansas City. And, you know, he's another veteran guy. who Guys come to him for information on the defensive line. And I said, I'm in the locker room the other day, and it's bustling. I mean, I've been in here, and you have too. Mm-hmm. There, there, there are guys who come in there on Wednesdays and Thursdays to meet the media, and they do so diligently. But in the past – you know, that place with cricket sometimes, you know, guys don't want to answer questions about losing. What's different about this team? Because it doesn't feel like a losing season. I, I'm just, that's from my perspective. Maybe you guys are internally looking at it a different way, but I just hear it. I feel it. There's energy in that room. What, what, do you, what is your guess? I guess. And if, do you feel that? Or am I, or am I just making it up? No, I do feel it. Okay. I do feel it. I, I think there's a couple things. Um, one, it, it may be, it may be just the fact that we the type of kind of guys we have in the locker room. You know, we have guys who care about each other. I said this the other day. Someone asked yeah. me this question. We have guys who care about each other and guys who, um, you know, it's not just it's all about them. You know, when you're when you're losing and it's all about you and you know you're just so self centered, then it's it's hard to find really any joy in what we're doing. I think we have guys who care about each other. You know, we have good chemistry. 
Um, another thing that's been brought up, which I think is true, is, is the way that um, Flus kind of handles wins and losses. Like, it's very consistent, you know. You know, there's not too much really high after a win and not too really low after a loss. So if you are really, really low after a loss and then you lose four or five in a row, then it's just five weeks of being really, really low, and then you can kind of just get stuck there. Mm. Um, so I think that's another thing. And then maybe I think another thing may be the youth. Yeah aspect of it again we talked about how we're young like um just bringing excitement yeah. and stuff to the locker room young teams man they're dangerous i mean there are five more games left in this season you're probably looking forward to that bye week because it's the latest bye week i, I ever recall right yeah. for you too probably uh, everybody needs a little break but uh every game's gonna be tight it doesn't matter how undermanned the Bears may look on paper or what the other teams may be coming in. I just think, and it's been that way all season with rare exception, a couple of instances, mm -hmm. but I, I, it speaks to the coaching staff and the belief in each other and the opportunities being given here across the board to many different guys in many different positions. Would you say that's also part of this puzzle a little bit? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, that's the NFL in general. Like, there's not too many just. No, not this record. Right. This year, it's a record. Like, this one-score game's never been this many. Right. I don't know why. Do you? Just the parity. Everyone's on scholarship. Yeah. You know, okay. every, everyone plays good ball, and then um, somehow, I, I maybe it's something they need to do. They need to do a study on why that is. Like, they well, all just come down to the wire. Well, here, look at this. <clears throat> now, I, you know, when you watch tape, you're not watching it. Well, at least I, I'm not watching it in the progression of the game. It's one side of the ball. Okay. Right. So unless you watch the TV version, you're not seeing it that way. So the Philadelphia Eagles run for 360-plus yards, which, I mean, it's like high school level, right? Mm -hmm. 366 yards against the Green Bay Packers. But the Green Bay Packers lost by a touchdown. Now, if you looked at that and said 366, I don't even need to know the score. There's no way Philadelphia's losing that game, right? Well, I don't know. You'd have to look at the turnovers. What was the... Well, I don't know all that. I'm just saying, those, those, you that's, know? Re that's really the stat. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. takeaways. Right. If they have 366, but they turn the ball over three or four times, it's like... It seems like such dominance at the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. Like, how are they even, you know, but yeah. it, it's... That's why, you know, you need balance. You need you need to score touchdowns. Mm -hmm. You need to score touchdowns. And I know the takeaways are, are obvious. And then the return game, you know... Stretch of four straight games where you guys were victimized by return touchdowns, and those return touchdowns, way back to the days of Lovey Smith, he said, you know, you get one return touchdown, you, you're likely going to win. You have a greater chance of winning that football game. That's right. how tenuous it is. Yeah, I'm sure you said, heard this also. Yeah, I think Coach brought it up. It's maybe 72%. Which is crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. But it steals a possession. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what you're always trying to do as well. DeAndre Houston Carson, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio, 670, the score. Uh with all these new guys coming in, um, how good of a job, in your opinion, are these coaches doing teaching and getting guys ready to play on a moment's notice? Yeah, no, these, I mean, these are great coaches, honestly. Um, really good teachers. And I'm sure they have their work cut out for them, but our, you know, what we do is also um, schematically not, it, it is, it is detailed, but it's not extremely complicated. Um, so it is a system that you can come in and, and, pick up the bases yeah. fairly quickly, but I think they're doing a good job. Tell me about Brisker. Mm -hmm. Mentality, big body, he's having a heck of a year. I mm -hmm. uh, hope he comes back soon, but what, what, what have you been impressions of him? Well, for one, like you said, he's, he's extremely athletic, um, can cover, can cover anybody. I, the main thing that I've noticed about Brisk being around him for a little bit is just his competitiveness. Like, he's a true competitor. Um, he hates to lose. Obviously, he likes winning, but I think he hates to lose more than he, Which is, than he likes winning. Um, right. Yeah, he's just a competitor, a very physical guy. And he's just like really all of our rookies, I've noticed, are, they're pros already as rookies. You know, they take care of their bodies. They watch a lot of film. Those are the two things, I think, that really go into being a pro. And he has those two already. A couple <clears throat> weeks ago, uh, I get on the team plane, and I'm walking two guys behind Brisker. He sits down. Bam, iPad's out. Mm -hmm. Not even can I have something to drink. Boom, he's working. For sure. Do, do you find that seven years in that that has also been kind of a new, newer thing at every opportunity right after the game, getting into it? Or I guess it, it just been? depends on the guy. Yeah. Okay. Some guys just can't be easy until they see the plays, whether they be good or bad. Okay. You know, I'm kind of. Well, like I know that. what they're waiting to hear from. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I've, you know, I've seen I've seen some some 
real examples of guys who are obsessed with film, you know, to where you'll be out with dinner with them and they'll they'll have their iPad there watching. Oh, remember Kyle Fuller? Yeah. He was always in that yeah, thing. Always on his own. Open locker room, that thing was open 100% <laughs> of the time. Um, challenges of facing uh, Aaron Rodgers, who's banged up, looks like he's going to play on Sunday, uh, coming in here where he's had so much success. What, what still are the challenges with him and, and his crew? Yeah, obviously um, probably the number one thing is – very smart, you know. We have to try to do a good job of giving him some looks he hasn't hasn't seen. Um, I'd say um, arm talent. Obviously, he can make any throw. He can make any throw, and I mean he's one of the best of all time. You know, we just gotta. Yeah. He doesn't turn the ball over much, you know, historically. Um, so I'd say those probably three things. I'm assuming you get jacked up for something like this. Uh, I heard Justin Jones in the locker room. He's all wound up about it, the, the, the rivalry thing. You know, that's kind of dissipated over the years from my perspective, from players bringing it up because, you know, you're not homegrown here. You're from all, all, all over the country, all over the, mm-hmm. the world in some, play, in some cases with our locker room. And, you know, that has to take time to develop. But he did not like how it wound up in week two, and it's still bugging him. And, uh, you know, you've had plenty of them. you got – you had to leave the game last year in that game, and that, that ended your season. I'm sure that r- rings uh, in your ear a little bit too. What What is your impression of that matchup with the Packers and, you know? The robbery. Yeah, and, and just it's, it's, it's been uneven, you know? Yeah, no, it has. Yeah, it's been uneven. I'm, I'm sure you're sick of it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, everyone in Chicago. Yeah. yeah is it rightfully so? Um, yeah, I think every, every guy's different, I'd say. You know, someone who just got here – Two weeks ago, they might not feel it as much. Yeah. But I think if you've been on a team and once you like Justin, you play him one time and you start to feel it already. He's just like yep. the energy, the history behind it. And just that game is, is really special. Um, it's, a, it's really an honor to play in it. If yeah. you think about it. Like, Heck yeah. They've, been, they've met how many times? 200 and uh, so 206. <laughs> yeah, just, 206. That's special to be a part of that, you know, and to try to uphold the standard of Chicago Bears football. And each team has the same number of wins. Yeah. Are you aware of this? I am, yeah. Yes. And it's exact day, December 4th, 101 years ago, when the Bears got their first NFL win, and they've never trailed the Packers. It's even now, but they've never trailed. Sunday will be exactly 101 years ago. It's fate. Ah, it's going to be fun. Go get it. Let's hope have it. It's a firework show. <laughs> it's a firework show. Thank you so much yep. for taking the time. Have a great game. And good luck this weekend. Uh, That's DeAndre Houston Carson, our guest here on Bears All Access. When we return, I'll be joined by Tom Thayer once again. And Ty Dunn will join us. He's written a book about tight ends and spent a lot of time with the one and only Iron Mike Ditka. We'll talk about that next here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Calling all Bears fans, get the ultimate VIP fan package with Chicago Bears VIP. Secure a game ticket and appearance from Bears legends and more by visiting ChicagoBearsVIP.com. Kind enough to join Tom and I, Ty Dunn, uh, outstanding writer. You know you know, I mean it, Tyler. I, I've told you for years, you write great stuff. Uh, you're, you're working now, uh, formerly on the Packers beat. You're living in Buffalo Tell us about what you're doing with Go Long TD because it's a great newsletter. It talks about all things NFL. And if you're a Packer fan, it's heavily slanted in that direction. Our old friend Bob McGinn also working with you. Uh, we're going to get into that and the book you've written. But welcome to the program. How, how's it going? Two years now, this newsletter. You got it, Jeff. Hey, thank, thanks so much for having me. It, it's great to uh, see you, to hear you. It's, it's been a bit. So I always love when we can connect like this. Um, yeah, launch GoLongTD.com. Uh, two years ago, about uh, last week, so just had the two-year anniversary. Just w- wanted to really kind of zag where I guess a lot of sports media is zigging, right? A lot, of, a lot of fast food, a lot of memes and takes and gifs and tweets. And I've always kind of gravitated toward the long form, toward profile writing, feature writing, and just felt like I was in a place uh, with enough relationships around the NFL to cover the NFL through that lens. So, a uh, Substack as a platform was perfect. Could just, you know, write my features, report on them, do what I love to do, and see if people want to pay to read stories, right? That was the big unknown. Does anybody actually want to financially support this endeavor? And two years in, I, I'm in a really good place where, you know, we've got a free list. So people want to just, you know, plug in golongtd.com and hop on that free list. You can always upgrade to become a paid subscriber, which is just eight a month or 50 a year. And it's, it's been a lot of fun and, and try to 
get into Bears country here and there. You're right. We got a lot of Packer fans that remember those Milwaukee Journal Sentinel days. Uh, but we've, we've got a, a decent Bears crew, too. I know Olin Groots came on one of my happy hours once. He was great. Um, we've examined the quarterback situation. Tim Jennings had him on for a Q&A once. So if, if people subscribe, I'll listen to you and give you what you want. Uh, it's funny you said Substack and Tom there quickly and wait, wait, that's something that sounds like a play. So I don't know what Substack is either, either Tom, but you heard Substack. You're like, okay, let's go. What are we doing? Line up and go. What the heck is a Substack? So it's um it's a newsletter platform basically. Okay. So if, if you want to, it's it basically it's a home for, for writing. It's it's a, an alternative to social media. If you want to you. take your brain back, they've got a lot of newsletters on there. You know, sports, music, politics, culture. Everything. Um, a lot of people kind of broken off of corporate media and, you know, for one reason or another, if they want to be your own boss and start your own company, you can do that. So I, I created Go Long. It's it's my own company, but Substack is like the host gotcha. for it to disperse the stories in addition to the URL. Hey, Ty, give me a little bit of your feeling about the NFL today because you got older quarterbacks into their late 30s and 40s. And then you got a star-driven group of quarterbacks, you know, like your your Joe Burrow or your uh, Justin Fields, and some of the young star-studded quality quarterbacks you have. How, what is your feeling of the NFL today? That's a great question because I feel like the NFL today, if you're going to excel with your young quarterback, you've got to create an infrastructure that allows that quarterback to shine. Like take advantage. Of what, of what that quarterback does well, and it it sounds very elementary to speak in those terms, but, I mean, I just did a series on Tua Tonga Viola, flew down to Miami to figure out why he's in the MVP conversation, and, God, life under Brian Flores in that offense with where he was at, terrible, miserable, um, just tr- treated poorly in meetings and, and schematically, just didn't suit his gifts, and he didn't have Tyreek Hill around him. That, that helps as well. So I, I just think to, to get a head coach in Mike McDaniel, to get a receiver in Tyreek Hill, for him to show him 700 plays of him doing something well, it just took his confidence to a whole new level. And he, he, he remembered who he was at Alabama, who he was out in Hawaii, and he was that quarterback all along. So I think the coaches that get that, that it seems like the Bears get it with Justin Fields, right? Luke Getze and everything they're doing with him, t- taking advantage of his athleticism, his mobility, um, his arm talent and just create an offense that works for him. And yeah, they'll get around to using that hundred million to find him some players. But I, I think he's in a really good spot because this is a coaching staff and a team that's going to take advantage of what he does best, which I, I just, it blows my mind that more coaches and more teams don't just do that. It seems simple. But oh, so let's look at green Bay bears. Do you think this is the most opposite end of the spectrum of a talent like Aaron Rodgers and then the other side of talent like Justin Fields, that they're completely two different quarterbacks? Yeah, I mean, on, on the flip side, and I've been pretty opinionated on, on this subject to go along. I think Green Bay just completely botched this. Missed a golden opportunity. You train Aaron Rodgers at the peak of his powers. You know what he is personally. You know what he is professionally. You know everybody this side of Tom Brady they're going to lose a little athleticism. They're going to lose a little on their fastball. It's inevitable. Father time is undefeated. And you had an opportunity to just get, what, three first, three seconds, jury, Judy, Patrick, Sertan, whatever you wanted. And it's a piece of paper. He was the MVP. And yet you bent the knee at every turn from the offseason that he held you hostage all through that offseason into the next offseason. So now they're screwed. I mean, now he's making 50 mil. His contract's an albatross. You've got a lot of bad contracts. You've got a young quarterback who looks pretty good. The, guy, the pick that started the song, Jordan Love, has developed. He showed you some stuff. What an opportunity to get him some reps. But if we learned anything through this whole charade, it's, um, I don't, you know, Matt LaFleur is the head coach in writing. Gudikins is the GM in writing. But Aaron Rodgers can just do what Aaron Rodgers wants. If he wants to play, he's going to play. If he wants to play in 2023, he'll play in 2023. It just kind of blows my mind that, they had this opportunity and they they missed it and we'll see what happens. I mean, maybe maybe Love is able to be the guy and they are, can't put some pieces around him. But if they go that route, it's going to be really really tough. Whereas in Chicago with Justin Fields, they're in position to put the pieces around him and really build for the future. 
Tyler Dunn, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670, the score from golongtd.com. Check him out. Great newsletter indeed. And he's written a book. It's called The Blood and Guts, How Tight Ends in Big Capital Letters Tie Save Football. Uh, Certainly you got to talk to the coach because he was Iron Mike before he was the coach. And the first 18 pages dedicated to a guy that kind of kicks off the book as changing the way the position was played and uh, a big reason why he's a Hall of Famer, because when you get guys that revolutionize a position or a scheme or a trend in the league, you're likely bound for Canton. Tell us what was the genesis of this book and about your conversations, because you went down to Naples to visit with with Iron Mike. Absolutely. The, the genesis, I think, is, you know, I, big picture. I've always wanted to write a book, just didn't really know what the topic would be. And when you think about the sport and everything we love about the sport, the blocking, the tackling, the big plays, this is, it's all distilled to that tight end position. And I think, you know, when you watch the game today, it's like the league is trying to find this utopian middle ground with violence that doesn't really exist with the flags and the fines. I mean, look at last night, DeMar Hamlin. I mean, he hits the receiver in the end zone. I, I don't know what he's supposed to do on that play. So I'm kind of an old soul in that regard. I feel like the NFL is, trying to operate in both the safe space and the octagon. Just own your violence. Own what you are. Nobody's maiming receivers today, right? It's not like it used to be in Dicka's day. So when you know it, you see it. So I guess it came from a place of just being a little pissed off and trying to <laughs> want to write a book that preserves the game and everything we love about the game. And you, you get that at tight end. You get it in Mike Dicka. He started the position from square one. Nobody even used the term tight end before he broke onto the scene with John Mackey in the 60s. So, um, yeah, absolutely had to go down there, right, to Dicka's world, hang out with him in the clubhouse, and uh, it, it was wild. I, I think that there's a lot about Dicka that, that you guys certainly know, but I think a lot of common fans just don't really remember him as a player. They don't remember him as that apex predator on the field, taking names, kicking butt, like just really asserting himself at, at – the top of the food chain in a way nobody had really done in the sport before. And then schematically, you know, George Hallis obviously had a lot to say about the tight end and offensive football, but the name he brought up again and again is Luke Johnson's, his coordinator, and just kind of teaching him to line up a little bit off of the tackle, a little bit off, and then that gives you the ability to have a two-way release, to run left, to w- run right, right, and then once he caught a pass, it was – you know, hell on wheels. He just ran over everybody that moved. I, I had the opportunity to visit with him several years ago just to, to catalog his history for preservation with the Bears, with the, the greats of the game. Gail Sayers also was privileged to do that. And I, he had me in stitches because the storytelling is with still a, a, a toughness bent to it, right? So he's not laughing. He's serious uh, about some yeah. of the stuff. But yeah. the, 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 <laughs> said, yeah. because we got Bears-Packers, it's the Nitschke battle. The Nitschke, he and Nitschke hated him, and they became friends. But, boy, the, the collisions and the nastiness of those two is also profiled in it. And then I'll lead you to Tom, who actually played for the guy. So, But how about those Nitschke-Ditka battles? They, they, I mean, that was that – was, really the era, the decade that made American football the number one sport in America. I mean, I think the ratings, the numbers, every everything you'd want to look at suggests that the 60s is when football was modernized and became the real American pastime. And you, you could say Mike Dicka was the number one reason for that. If you're going to create like a Jerry West silhouette logo, it's probably Iron Mike because of the way he played and because of those battles with Niche. He, he had me in stitches too. I mean, he – he can remember, like, you know, getting clotheslined, you know, getting blindsided, just getting just drilled by Nitschke in those those Packer Bear games, and not thinking it's a dirty play, right? It's not like, oh, th- 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 this is out of bounds, you know, I, uncalled for. No, it's he got me. I'm going to get him, and he would, and it, it it spilled into you know everyday life. They're outside of a restaurant in Milwaukee and going at it. It's. And like you said, they, they became friends. They're, you know, I think that's the cool thing about it. You can beat the hell out of each other on the field and be perfectly fine to each other off of it. Uh, whether it's Dicka, John Mackey, even a Jackie Smith, he had so many stories as well. Getting into it with Dick Buckus, you know, on the other end of the spectrum. Um, I, I just can't get enough of that era. I'll admit, I mean, I was pretty ignorant when it comes to football in the 60s and 70s. I'm 35. That's before my time. I'm just thinking, you got a bunch of, you know, shoemakers and, 
you know, milkmen in their, their, as their day jobs, and they're just kind of playing football as a hobby. All right, you look at some of these guys' dick is running over. Well, granted, some of these guys' dick was running over. Maybe they did look very small compared to the players today. But the rule book was about as thin as a brochure. You could do whatever the hell you wanted to out there. So I think that we have to take that into consideration. Ty, I would love your feedback on this. So I played for Mike Dicker for eight years, and he was the the template of toughness in all aspects of football, special teams, offense, and defense. But he really didn't feature the tight end as a main key to offensive success. It was more Walter Payton offensive line. Then let's bring you to the modern-day NFL with Andy Reid, who was a former offensive tackle, and now he features the tight end of one of his main positions of success does it surprise you that a former tight end doesn't feature it but then a former offensive tackle does feature it that's a great question because that does come up year to year decade to decade era to era where as i'm hanging out with everybody from dicka to gronk and and kittle today and everybody in between ben Coates, tony gonzalez mark bruner's in there we've got we run the whole gamut of don't forget mark bravaro my, of course, Mark Bavaro, Jeremy Shockey. I mean, yeah. threw back some drinks with Shockey in Miami Beach, which is <laughs> every every bit of crazy as you can imagine reading this book. Uh, but I feel like it it was a very small group of innovators that kept the position evolving over time. It wasn't like like a Dicka or you know p- p- pick your tight end that became a coach or a coach who coached tight ends. It wasn't like it, it became this wave, right? This tidal wave of people who understood what the tight end can do. It was a Luke Johnsos. It was uh, Don Coryell with Kellen Winslow. It was a, a Mike, Mike Pope, you know, a, a, the position coach for Bavaro and Ben Coates and Jeremy Shockey, Sean Payton, Bill Parcells. It, it kind of was sporadic with coaches who realized, okay, this is a, this is a big dude who can both block, and run up the seam, make a play down the field, and it, it is impossible to cover for a corner, a safety, a linebacker, all the way to Tony Gonzalez. I mean, he's really I – mean, you can make the case that he's the best tight end ever if you want because he opened up the door for a completely new type of athlete. You know, a select group of coaches to realize what this player could do to the point now where if you're not hunting for an athletic tight end, you'll probably be out of a job. All right, our final uh, moments here with uh, Tyler Dunn, who's written the book, The Blood and Guts, How Tight Ends Save Football. So let's get back to the title to wrap us up uh, before this great Bears-Packers matchup at Soldier Field on Sunday. Why do you feel they save, or is it just like you said, the preservation of the sport <laughs> as we remember it? Why, why will tight ends save football? Right, it's present tense. You're absolutely right. You're in the trenches. You have to roll up the sleeves. You have to block still. Yet, it's third night, there's 70,000 screaming fans, millions of people watching at home. The quarterback's going to you. I mean, you're the quarterback's best friend. Peyton Manning and Dallas Clark, the hours they put in, insane. Drew Brees, Jimmy Graham, Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, right down the list. Drew Bledsoe and Ben Coates. So you have to do a little bit of everything. So that's football in a nutshell. But, yeah, I I just feel like we're so offended by everything today. And I don't don't like it. I don't get it. I think it's weird – to, that society has gotten softer and is offended and that applies to the football field. I think we have to reach an agreement that if you are on that field, and the players get this, they do, offense, defense, everybody gets this. If you're on that field, you are a, a subscribing to a, a certain element of, of risk. You understand the inherent risk that's involved with football. And guess what? So many of these guys in the past, they didn't know the risks. You know, they, they didn't realize the head trauma and even ligament damage and everything that it, it, it could do to you later in life. Well, I didn't. I mean, that I've talked to. Today, the knowledge is through the roof. So you, you can make that decision. Is this for me or is this not for me? And if it's for you and you step onto that field, I, I don't understand why we have to, you know, have the rule book that's, you know, th- this thick now as opposed to the brochure. And, and nobody knows what it catches. Nobody knows how to tackle. Nobody knows how to hit. We're all just kind of dazed and confused. And I, I think that if you siphon out of that, if you siphon that violence out of the game, you're going to lose football. It's going to become something different. Um, but the tight end, you still have to hit. You still have to catch. You have to do everything. As Rob Gronkowski, George Kittle, a lot of these guys break down in detail, we can preserve the game at that position. The blood and guts. Where can people find it? 
Oh, anywhere you get books, um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Indie Books, also uh, golongtd.com. I'm always running deals. So if you sign up, there's a good chance you'll see a deal where, hey, come an annual subscriber, you'll get a book. All right. Hey, nice job. Number one of many, right? We're going to have volumes of this stuff. <laughs> Tyler Dunn, our guest. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Love the conversation, fellas. Thanks so much for having me. All right, Tyler. Thanks, we'll Tyler. talk to you down the road. We'll, we'll have you on again for sure to talk about uh, the Please. rest of the league. Uh, coming up next, Tom and I finish our thoughts on Bears Packers version 206 coming up at Soldier Field here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by CDW. People who get it, Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer, wrapping things up in our final segment to take a look at the matchups in Bears Packers version 2. Uh, week 2. Justin Fields in the offense threw for just 70 yards. He, he ran the ball eight times. That could change drastically on Sunday. There are different parties involved here. No Rashad Gary. Now the Bears have Chase Claypool. There's no Darnell Mooney. No Eddie Jackson. No Robert Quinn. No Roquan Smith. They've got changes. Justin Watson's become a instant star. Six touchdowns in the last uh, three games. Crazy how much in just from week two to now that these two teams, the complexion of them has changed. What hasn't changed, they both lost seven of eight. Yeah, and they're both trying to figure out where their quarterback is. You know, you don't know, you know, as much, there's been as much conversation about Aaron Rodgers over these last couple of weeks as there has been about the emergence of Justin Fields. And I think that's the point of success for both football teams. They need Aaron to play like he once did, and they need Justin to continue on that road of improvement. And then that's when you bring in the defense. How is the defense of Green Bay going to react to Justin? And how is the defensive pressure and defensive backfield going to react to playing Aaron Rodgers? And um, I think it's uh, it's going to be an unbelievable game. And, and to just imagine that it, with the storyline behind the quarterback position, that it comes down to being Green Bay and Chicago, the oldest rivalry in the NFL, and two quarterbacks that couldn't be on different on two different roads of their of where their their football life is going. Let's talk about the backs because they've got two good ones, and they did do some damage to the Bears. The, the Aaron Jones is an outside zone runner. He is absolutely fantastic. I love how he plays the game. Uh, there are questions about how much they give him the football sometimes. Not enough. They don't incorporate him all the time the way you would think in the passing game. But uh, And then there's David Montgomery, who right now, aside from the runs and the, and the yard from scrimmage, he's second in yards per catch among running backs behind Derrick Henry in Tennessee now. He's up over 11 yards a catch, and you've been on this for a while about getting him involved in the passing game. And it's not just – okay, he's got good hands. It's what he does with it after he catches the football. Right, because, you know, most of the time that he gets a catch outside the box, outside the framework of tight end to tackle, he's usually facing a third-level defender. And there's not a lot of defensive backs that are volunteering to tackle David Montgomery one-on-one in space. And, you know, David Montgomery does not want to go out of bounds. If he has a challenge of a tackle or near the edge of the field, he's going to take the challenge and not the edge. And I know that Doug Coletti could probably figure it out. There's a great stat of how many yards that Walter Payton had in his total of not going out of bounds rather than staying in the field to play. And that's what Dave Montgomery does with the great challenge to the when he does able to catch the ball on the exterior. At the same time, Packers have given up uh, the 31st most runs of 10 yards or more. Uh, They've allowed 70 points on first possessions of each half of which the Bears have scored, I think, 80 total points in the first drives of each half. Um, There's things here the Bears do well. that Their scoring drive percentage is higher than the Packers, who are 26th in the league offensively doing that. It's it's a lot of interesting math for a a lot of different reasons. Um, Where are your focuses on keys to the game? Okay, let me ask you a question, though. If the Bears go out there and they win the coin toss, do you deflect, defer it to the second half, or do you take the kickoff and hopefully you can get up seven to nothing, and then you can give your defense a little bit of a chance to be aggressive on that first drive, trying to get at Aaron Rodgers and trying to limit their success? It's something that you really have to contemplate because I'm a big believer. You win the coin toss, you defer, but I don't want to see Aaron Rodgers with the ball in his hands that first drive and then do something with it. So, you know, you're kind of 
adding some confusion <laughs> with the question you just brought up well, and their yeah. lack of success the, at the halves. Right. Uh, I, I, I kind of with you. Let's take out the Louisville slugger and go right down the field and get on the board, get on top, because the Packers haven't proven they could do much with that. They've had a couple comebacks, but they like playing on the lead, and he's always had the lead on the Bears. This is how he works, and, and sometimes it's a two-score two game and you're not, you're not getting back. Um, maybe it's different now because of Justin Fields and the way this offense has been able to score points. How about, how about defensively? What should the bears be bracing for? Uh, be worried about Aaron Rodgers throwing a deep pass to Watson. The very first offensive play they get, you go back to the first play of the season. Watson dropped the ball that was delivered perfectly by Aaron Rodgers against the Minnesota Vikings. And they were, they failed to have any type of comeback opportunity after that. And, it really, uh, you know, kind of fractured a little bit of the relationship throughout the early portion of the season. However, Watson has really come on. So if they go out there and they say, okay, they have a tough time getting pressure on the opponent's quarterback, and I have a guy that tell me his 40 time because I know it right. At, I know you know it right at the top of your head. I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's uh, in, it's in the four three range. Yes, it's in the right. four three range. So that's what I'm saying. You know, you get a guy like Watson who they've been able to take advantage of, even when Jordan Love came in the other night. They hit him with a slant route, and he took it to the house. So my biggest fear is that first play challenging the Bears' defense to see if anybody can stick with Watson, the speedster. 4-3-6, big time. There four, you three, go. Six. I know you, I four, know you four, would know it. 4-3-6. Um, yeah, he's been, he's been outstanding, and he's, he's owning it, too. He, he enjoys being in the spotlight. You can see him when he scores touchdowns. He folds his arms and stares at the crowd, and he's, he's got that – a number one receiver type attitude as a, as a rookie right now. He does have five drops this season, and the Packers have had a lot of drop passes this year, uh, more than more than you might expect. Uh, all right, offensive line. Let's talk about it. The, of the potential that Alex Leatherwood could be involved in some fashion, he is getting paid a lot of money because of that deal that the Bears uh, did t- taking him off waivers from the Raiders. Would you like to see him at some point this season, or even as soon as Sunday? Oh, I need to see him. I need to see what this guy is going to offer the Bears. Listen, you know, you talk about the Bears-Green Bay game. He's fortunate to be able to play at home, to listen, listen, be able to hear the count from Justin Fields. This guy has played in big games throughout his career. There is no bigger program in college football than Alabama when he played there. So he's not going to come in there and be shocked at 61,500 because he's played on both sides of the ball in an away crowd and a home crowd of 100,000. So, listen, if Alex Leatherwood can play – and you put him wherever, whatever, te- you know, I, I assume he's going to play right tackle, then allow him to be physical. Watch his feet on terms of pass blocking responsibility. So I, I'm excited and I want to see Alex Leatherwood finally get his opportunity. Oh, we'll see that. He started every game last year for the Raiders. This Bears matchup with the Packers brought to you by PNC, the official bank of the Bears. Want to thank our guests here today, DeAndre Houston Carson, the Bears nominee for the Sportsmanship Award, the Art Rooney Sportsmanship Award, uh, recognizing players who exemplify outstanding sportsmanship on the field. So great guest. Thanks to Tyler Dunn, who's written a book about the tight end position called The Blood and Guts from GoLongTD.com. Check him out as well. Thanks to our producers and most of all to you for listening. Tom, we'll see you Sunday. I'll be there. Be angry, all right? Be I angry. am already. <laughs> That's Tom there. I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks to everyone for listening tonight. This is Bears All Access brought to you by IGS Energy on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Good night.